One of the things that, that I mentioned very casually, and I'd like to come back to that's not in your workshop manual, is how much money do you want to make as a salesperson in our industry? And I briefly referred earlier to a guy who makes $100,000 a year, and his company couldn't talk him for any amount of money into getting into the management of that company. He says, no, you guys worry about all the headaches. I'm going to go out and sell and have fun. I also know a guy that's learned to make an awfully healthy income who works nothing but add-ons for his company. He does nothing but work add-ons. And he was a customer service person for his company. And his sales comp the salespeople in his company wouldn't make calls to see who, could t who they could talk to about add-ons. So this guy took it over at the request of the owner of the company. And he typically sells seven, eight, nine thousand a week in add-ons for his company. And the sales people in that company, and this is a company out in the eastern country of eastern U.S., the salespeople hate him. And I say, shame on you. You shouldn't hate him. You should go out and do what he's doing, and then he wouldn't have to do it. But if you sales folks aren't smart enough to go call on your, your existing customers and get the add-ons, the company's entitled to that business, and they've got somebody <coughs> else that'll do it. So uh, the salespeople need to take a long look at themselves. But what I want to do is take a minute for a handout that I gave you and talk about making money in the security business and how much money is a, is a good income for you. And before I can do that, I'd like you to define some things with your assistance. What would you consider the average system to cost to the end user. I'm going to use an illustration here of $2,000 if that's okay with you. Does that sound like a reasonable price for the average sale that we make in our industry? Anybody object to that? So our average sale will be $2,000 just because I want a round number for what I want to present you with. Now then, Mr. and Mrs. Salesperson, let me tell you what it's intelligent to pay you in our business. Your company didn't know I was going to tell you how to get paid, did they? I'm going to suggest that a company who really wants to be in our business for the long term and not go broke should pay a commission of 12%. They may have a draw against commission to encourage new quality people to join their company, but I'm going to suggest that that commission is 12% if the lead is a house lead. The company hands you a lead and says, here, Jerry, go out and, and make this call, and I'll give you a 12% commission when you bring the contract back. Now, Jerry, if you, in fact, generated this lead yourself, instead of us giving you the lead, we'll pay you an additional 2%. Now, Jerry, if instead of selling this as in a local alarm system, it's a contract for monitoring system, we'll pay you another 2%. So you have the potential, if you're selling the ideal business we'd like to bring to our company, of 16% commission on every sale. And I'm encouraging you and giving you an incentive to write the kind of business that we would like to have as a company. Now, if in fact, 16% as our ideal commission is what we're paying, then this, this $2,000 sale is a $320 commission to you. Right, Jerry? Yes. Okay. Now then, Jerry, we have to determine what your closing ratio is. And before we have a closing ratio, we have to have somebody to show our product to, don't we? So what is reasonable Somebody who's experienced in making security systems demonstrations, what is a reasonable number of demonstrations that I should expect my new person to make in this business on a weekly basis? Joe? Seven to 10. Seven to 10. Okay. Anybody have a different number? Okay, Joe, I'm going to take issue with you. I want to help people learn to believe in themselves, and I want to help them in generating business where I want them to expect, as a minimum requirement, that they're going to see 10 to 15 people a week. 
I don't think it's unrealistic to ask people to show our product and shoot for 15 a week. Yes, Mel. No. Com combination. Com anywhere we can get somebody to get in front of, Mel, I don't care where it comes from, I want my goal to try to get 15 presentations a week. Now, how in the world do I get in 15 presentations a week? Well, it's simple. We've got Monday through what day of the week to work? Monday through Sunday? Well, I'm not quite as hard as you. Is that Matt that said that? I don't know who said that. Monday through Saturday is our work week. You see, Mr. New Salesperson, Jerry, I'm going to use you as my example. Jerry, we're literally giving you the ability to come into a business and start up your own business here without any investment. We're going to provide you with a demo kit. We're going to provide you with training. We're going to go out and help you with some of your initial business. And as a result, we're putting you into business. And I don't know most people who own businesses that don't understand that owning your own business is a seven-day-a-week job. So I guess I shouldn't feel guilty about asking you to consider working six days a week. Would you say that's fair? OK. So out of 15 days, uh, six days a week, we have to try to find a way to make 15 presentations a day, uh, a week. So I want to explain to you that every evening, Monday through Thursday, is demo night. And we should be showing two people every night. Now, everybody who's an experienced salesperson in this industry here is sitting back there thinking, well, Wilson, it's been a while since you've been out on calls because it's impossible to get in two every night. No, it isn't. But it takes somebody who's giving 110% to their job to get in two a night, four nights a week. And you have to also learn some new dis disciplines. You have to schedule your first demo for 6 p.m. and the second one for 8.30. And you have to make people work on your schedule. And if you get demanding and tell people you have a schedule, people respond to it. They only want direction. They say, what do I have to do? And they'll work with you. And now, if you'll look at this, if you have a 6 p.m. demo, that demo, if you write it, can't be more than two hours. It gives you 30 minutes to get to the next one depending on what the size of your market area is. If you don't sell it, and you've made the proper attempts to, to get the order tonight, you may get out of there in an hour and a half, maybe in 15 minutes if they want a 395 system. It's still one of your demos for the week. But if you're working on two demos Monday through Thursday, we're going to be very reasonable and accept the fact that Friday night is family night, and we're calling on families. And we may not try as hard to get in our two demos every Friday night, but we'll have a little time to spend with our family, too, if we're married folks, or even if you're single and you want that for date night. But in addition to these two, two or three days a week, you want a daytime demo. And so if you add eight up here, and you added in three more here, you're now up to 11. Well, we're going to miss 15 this week, but if I got in two to three more on Saturday, I'm now up to 12 or 15 demos a week. And anybody that thinks that's asinine and too demanding ought to reevaluate the quality of their work week. It's not supposed to be a country club. Right now, you're trying to get your momentum going and get started on a program that you're going to commit yourself to, not because your boss said it or because Warren Wilson said it at a seminar, but you're going to get excited enough and know that working and talking to other people about security in their lives is fun, it's not work, to where you're going to be totally committed to getting in those 12 to 15 demos a week. Does anybody want to argue with me on that? Or debate with me, or whatever you want to call it? OK. <clears throat> now that we've established 12 to 15 as the magic number that we're going to strive for on an average week, we have to determine what our closing ratio is. And I went with the number of 15 per week. And if we're going to give 15 demos a week, and we're going to close 20% of them, then I only have to write three orders that week out of the 15. 
And out of the three, I make $960. See, I'm a math major, so I understood how to come to 960. And if I just wrote my three residential sales a week for 50 weeks, because see, I'm going to give you a two-week vacation your first year in a business with me, then I'm going to make $48,000. And you only have to close 20% of the people that you go out and see this week, Chris. Is that very demanding? No, I'm giving you the benefit of being new to our business. Maybe even new to sales. Okay, now let's go ahead and upgrade that and say we're going to get a little better after the first two or three months of selling. And now we're closing four systems a week. And at four systems a week on the very same program, 50 weeks a year, you've now raised your income to 64000 a year. You are now making more money than 95% of the people in the United States. And that's very feasible to do that. Even if you're only giving 12 demos a week and closing 25%, you're still writing four orders a week, aren't you? But see, you have to get these kind of numbers in your head and get committed to the numbers that you control. Do you control, Chris, how many dollars you write a week? No, you don't. You can't control how many dollars you're going to turn in at the end of the week because you don't know how big an order Warren Wilson's going to buy from you and Roland and that kind of thing. But you do control the number of people that you're going to commit to yourself that you're going to see this week. And so you have to work on the things that you control and you can control your prospecting activities that generate appointments for you and in turn control demos. And now all you have to do is continually work on the improvement of your selling techniques to where you have a 25% closing ratio. So only concentrate on the things you have control over and quit worrying about what the dollars look like at the end of the week. They take care of themselves if you concentrate on making presentations, finding the periods of the week that you can get in your structure of, of daytime and, and evening presentations. Discipline yourself to where you don't spend all evening on one presentation. You see the sales folks that, that write up an order, and now you're part of the family, Tony. And they love you, and you love them. They had enough confidence to spend $2,000 with you. They have a very high opinion of you, don't you agree? Mm -hmm. So they say, hey, Tony, it really has been fun, and we enjoyed meeting you. Uh, the wife fixed a little uh, coffee cake. Why don't you have a piece of cake and a cup of coffee with us before you go? And because you love each other, it's very natural to say, well, yeah, I think I will. And you have to say, no, I'm really sorry, Warren. I don't have time because I promised the, the, the Lewises that I'll be there at 830. Can I take a rain check and I'll be back for a piece of her next coffee cake? So you don't offend them, but you have to move on. You don't sit around in coffee club because you're still wanting to get in your two presentations a night. And you have to be prepared for the nights when the six o'clock when you get there decides they change their mind, they won't let you show it to them or they just aren't there, period. And hopefully, if you're prospecting that area, you'll have somebody else you can maybe make a cold call and maybe sneak an extra one in. Or maybe you have a, an insurance demo for the night where you tell a couple, look, I don't think I can see you tonight, but in case something should happen on one of my other two appointments, could I come by and see you anyway? And the person working 110% effort literally comes up with that extra magical demo you need to fill in that gap. And it does work. In all my years of selling and motivating salespeople, folks, I had one thing I tried to get across. Don't tell me you can't do something. Because I had people in those cookware days that would come up to me, Jack, and say, you can't sell those products during the daytime. All those single girls are working. And I'll tell you what, Jack, if you really believe that, I'll make you a promise, and I'll sign it in blood. I will not make a demonstration after 5 o'clock in the evening, and you can sell 24 hours a day, and I'll outsell you this week. In the several years that I ran a sales organization, I only had one man who I couldn't outsell, and he was fantastic, a dear friend of mine. But he was the only guy that paid that 110% price and knew that there is no such thing as I can't. If there is such a thing as a born salesman, I've had the luxury of working with one because he didn't have a negative bone in his body. But I have to tell you, anybody that says I can't sell at Christmas time, you're wrong. People are in a buying mood at Christmas time. Anybody that says I can't sell in the daytime, you're wrong. There are people who do take days off or work night shifts and things like that.
and you can see them. You just have to start looking and working smart enough to get in those extra presentations that you want on a weekly basis. And if you take those factors and you go on up to where you're only selling 33%, Chris, your sales force is only selling 33%, that's now five orders a week, you're now showing them how to make 80,000 a year. And if you were one of those superstars that could close 50% of what you show, we can talk to you about making $100,000 a year. And I get excited as a sales manager about talking to another person about how to make $100,000 a year and believing that I'm being genuine and sincere and talking to them about it. Now, the only thing we have to find out is whether they're willing to give us 110% or not. Because if they want to play more than they want to work, they don't want to get out and scratch for that insurance appointment, those other things, then they don't deserve and they can't make 100000 They probably can't even make 60000 because they're looking for an easy way out. Any questions or comments on the theory? It's demanding, but people who want to get ahead in the world are on fire, and they're so intense that they can achieve those kind of demands. I've met many of them over my experiences, and it's so exciting to be around people who are that committed and intent on what they're doing for themselves, not for their sales manager, or because people like Warren Wilson stand up in seminars and say it can be done. Okay. You can make whatever you set your mind to pay the price for in the security business. We're going to spend just a couple minutes setting up something that we will carry on further after lunch hour. We've got about 10 minutes by my watch till lunchtime. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Do we make the, the survey first or do we make the demonstration first? And if I were to poll this group, I guarantee you it would be split 50-50. And it doesn't matter whether you make the survey or the presentation first. We're going to talk about the presentation, and I'm going to steal something from Tom Hopkins after a while on the presentation, because in his book, he, he tells you the demonstration portion of your meeting with a prospect should be 17 minutes. And because Warren Wilson is such a magnanimous person, I'm going to tell you I'll give you 20 minutes. But if you catch yourself, Andy, going through the demonstration part where you've talked about too many different levels of arming and all that, and you've watched when you started and stopped, and you find out you're talking 21 minutes, I want the little man in the back of your head to say, Warren Wilson would say, you're doing it wrong. I want you to be that critical of yourself that you limit yourself to doing the demo in 20 minutes or less. But let's talk about the survey in the time we have until lunchtime. And then we're going to get into the features and benefits, which we can't do in 20 minutes here. But we are going to show you all the things that we have to talk about as features and benefits after lunch. Survey. Some people say that how can you talk about how to apply a product to an uh, environment until you know what the environment is. So you need to be able to walk around the home, inside and out, and find out what it's all about. And you probably need to get them involved in that survey. How many of you do a survey and you don't include the prospect in the survey? Still not getting any hands rolling. OK, good for you. A survey is another way to get people involved and get them committed and start heightening their, their fear index or creating their need for them beyond whatever they thought it was when you first arrived. So, in talking about going around and doing a survey, there's a lot of things that go into a survey that have nothing to do with selling a security system. But if you have care for your prospect, if you have warmth, if you have the things we talked about earlier today, then it's your obligation to show them the things they can do, regardless of whether they buy an alarm system from you or not. Make them feel better about the time they spent with you this evening. Give them something for nothing. And that builds their confidence in you to want to take something and give it back to you. So as you walk around the home, look and see whether or not they're using deadbolt locks. I have nine panes of glass in my back door that goes out to my patio. Would you recommend I put a deadbolt lock right there on the inside of that door? 
Okay, no, I'm going to put one with the little butterfly on the inside, Jack. Do you want me to put that there? No, you don't, because anybody can break that pane and reach in. And so what am I going to do about that door? Do you have any ideas? Sure. If you want to use a thumb turn uh, lock, mm -hmm. you need to put one up high that uh, would be more difficult to reach, and one that the panes probably don't go all the way to the floor. Good for you. That's all I wanted you to say, is if you put it up high, the nine panes are in the upper half of the, the, okay. of the window, so all you have to do is break the upper pane, and you can still reach and turn off and turn that latch if you put it up high. But if you put it down by the floor, no one's arm is long enough even to reach through that broken window and get clear down there to turn off. So you could still show people how to put a deadbolt lock on a, on a door with a lot of glass in it if there's an area that typically you can't reach at arm's length. So yes, you could put a deadbolt lock on my back door. <clears throat> So look around and, and, and give them some general instruction on how to apply other security devices that, that probably only cost $29.95 or, or even less, and let them know you're willing to help them make their home safer, regardless of the outcome of tonight's meeting, because you're now instilling in them confidence that you're really open-minded and a professional at what you're doing. As you walk around, uh, in terms of deadbolt locks, uh, Everybody knows the value of having a rod that you can put down in the track of a sliding glass door. If you haven't thought about that, it's very simple. Uh, lights on timers. I think most of us today use timers. And now we're getting more sophisticated where we're working on, on lights that have motion detection on them so they turn on if any movement is created in front of them. So they can even buy into that type of technology without getting into an alarm system. And we suggest that you would encourage your people when they're going to be gone during the daytime working to leave the radio on, not the TV. TVs do catch fire occasionally. But radios are a very safe device to, to give the appearance of uh, occupied area to someone who's coming up and trying to listen at the front door. And even if they ring the doorbell, maybe the person's too sick to come to the door. It makes doubts for the typical person who breaks into homes just by having the radio on. There is noise in there that you can't be certain of. And no burglars or cowards, they don't want to confront anybody. Let's talk about the exterior survey. And as you walk around and survey the outside of the home, we all can appreciate if there is a window or a door, it's accessible. And they've done a beautiful job of creating <coughs> landscaping outside where they have great big bushes there that conceal that door or window. It's a perfect entry place for an intruder because intruders are not too crazy about exposure to light, uh, to openness, to a lot of people out in front of them. They're going to go to areas where they can hide and be devious about what they're doing. So maybe you should suggest to them uh, uh, cutting back their hedges or changing the time, type of, of uh, shrubbery they use in certain areas of their home, uh, using outside lighting as well. Uh, the access to the home. When you're going around doing an outside survey, some feedback I've gotten from a couple of the other groups that have attended these, is first of all, never play the part of the burglar. You're a security expert. But you say, hey Ron, put yourself in the, in the position of someone wanting to break into your home. Now you tell me, if you were that person, how would you break into this home? And let Ron design how the burglar is going to get into his own home. It doesn't give you that bad in it, uh, connotation. And it gets him in the frame of mind to be thinking about the vulnerability of his home. Ron, you see that extension ladder you got laying along the side of the detached garage back there? Did you ever think that maybe an intruder would want in bad enough to stand it up against the house and get in through that upstairs bedroom window there because it's on the back of the house and you have nobody behind you that could see what they're doing? So maybe you'd want to put that away rather than leave it on the outside of the garage. There's all kinds of things like that you can do to get them involved and let them make their own decision on how to secure their property before we get into whether or not they're going to include security in their home or not. This afternoon, now that we have completed our discussion on residential survey, uh, we want to talk about the presentation of the product line and the potential of a demonstration rather than just talking about product from literature and all. And the thing that I'd like to point out to you is there's, there's something I want to create a mental picture for you
that is trying to be accomplished at this point in your presentation. We talk about we can't have a closing ratio, we can't sell or let people buy a, a service from us until we've established a need. And so if you'll always remember this picture here of the scales, uh, much like the scales of justice, and on the scales on one side you have the product that doesn't really represent the need, but it's going to have to be symbolic of the service and the benefits that we're going to talk about here in a couple minutes. Get me a glass of water, please. <clears throat> so on one side, we have the, the product and service that we want. And on the other pro side of the scale, we have the prospect's money. And what we're really trying to accomplish in this meeting is make them value the product and service that you have more than their money. And if you accomplish that, it's very easy to have a first call close. Thank you, Roland. <clears throat> so if you can take time as you're structuring a presentation to say, now how do I make people feel more, uh, have more desire for what I have to offer in a way of a service than the dollars involved, then it will be very easy to help them make a buying decision. and. Uh, both of you accomplish symbiosis. Okay, features and benefits of the product line. Remember earlier, we had a formula on the board for you of, called KISS, keep it simple, salesperson. Well, it's very simple on an ITI presentation. You go in with your demo kit, you open your demo kit, and you reach out and hand somebody a keypad. And this is how to start a presentation. Now, Joe already has the rest of his equipment all set up, so uh, he wouldn't do it in the same fashion that I'm going to present it to you here. But even if it were Joe Coleman, and he's got all his equipment set up as we do here, you hand the, the keypad to the, the uh, prospect and give them a minute just to look at it and kind of touch it. See, you're getting them involved by turning over the product and what product of all the things that are going to be involved in your presentation do they need to be the most familiar with? The keypad. Do they need to know what that control panel is all about? Oh, for some housekeeping reasons later on, they're going to want to know what the, the numbers and the lights and things mean. But right now, the main thing they want to know is how do I make this part of my life and be comfortable with it? And so we hand this over to Mr. and Mrs. Prospect and say this is an example of our arming station so that you can have your security system on or off as you so desire. And Tony, since you're the lady, I'm going to ask you to help me with my presentation very briefly here. If you will, just take your finger and touch any number on there. Did you hear the tone? We have something unique at ITI that you don't get with a lot of other security arming stations. Because the minute you touch a key, if you've depressed it properly, it speaks back to you by giving that tone. And so many times people are so used to using keypads like uh, calculators and typewriters, they want to run their keys over it real fast. You don't do that with a security system, or it's probably not going to get all of the digits of your combination, and therefore it doesn't work right, and now you start panicking because you're trying to turn it on or turn it off, get rid of sirens or something in a different uh, uh, position that the system might be in, and as a result, uh, you don't feel like your equipment's working properly when it's just that you were abusing its ability to perform properly. So what we're trying to help you learn to do is listen for the tone of the key when you touch it. And for example, if you will, just touch uh, five, six, seven, eight. And if you would do it exactly like you did there, never be in a rush, but depress intentionally the five, then the six, then the seven, then the eight, at about that speed, there's no way that you can ever go wrong. And for the sake of you in the alarm industry, who, who we get in front of for the first time and show you this keypad, I've literally had alarm dealers who are used to other products when they first hit this keypad and we tell them the co keypad code is one, two, three, four, they go one, two, three, four, and they hit the two and they didn't hit it right and it gives them no tone and I deliberately see them hit it a second time before they move on to the three and the four. I said, do you realize what you just did? You cut down on false alarms in your own habit even though you just used this for the first time because you recognize you didn't get the tone and you hit it again before you moved on to the next number. And it will make an impact on anybody that a keypad of anybody's doesn't work if the control panel doesn't get the information from each digit of the code. 
So we use a very simple four digit combination, Tony, to make our system work. And I'd like for you to understand that a combination is like a handshake. You have to tell your control panel that you're authorized to give it commands before you can hit any other command. And so your, co your code that you'll put in will always be five digits. The first four being your authority to use the keypad and the fifth one to tell it what to do. So you can't panic and forget and only hit four numbers. It'll always take five numbers to make anything work that requires your combination. Fair enough? Okay. For the sake of the lady who has long fingernails, how do we help her learn to use a keypad so she's not hitting it with her real long fingernails? Anybody want to suggest? Use her knuckles? Okay. You can use the knuckle and it'll work fine. But take your finger and put it up on the edge of the, key, of the frame and run it down over the one. Uh-huh. See, you, if you're long fingernails and you don't want to use your knuckles, that's not lady enough, like enough for you. You can literally take the keypad like this and run your fingers over it and it works just as well. The big thing is conditioning them to learn to use, use and listen for the tones to make a keypad function properly. Okay. Now then, what we'd like for you to understand about your system, Tony, is first of all how to turn it on and how to turn it off. So I'd like for you, if you would, to go one, two, three, four, four. Okay, we didn't get it. Two fours got two. I only hit the four once. Okay, one, two, three, four. And I was. Okay, that's okay. Anyhow, you put in your four-digit code and then you hit the four the second time and you're telling it you want to go to the away position. It means everybody's going to be away from home and you're master arming the system. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so every time that you want to turn on everything and be gone, that's all it takes is one, two, three, four, or whatever your four digits are plus the four to say away. Okay, now then, let's put it in a position where we're coming home and uh, since we have our equipment all set up, we'll come in through an entry door and when I come in, don't rush through it, you have plenty of time but I want you to go one, two, three, four, and then touch the zero to say disarm, okay? Now listen to the tone, first of all. Now did you notice it kept giving you the four beeps to say I'm in the away position until the time you finally get the complete code in, and then it gives you a long tone to say no, I've changed to zero now. So let me in condition you to a couple other things, Tony. You see the key up there that says status? Touch the, that key. Hear the long tone? That means zero. Now I want you to go one, two, three, four, one. Okay, now touch status. See the difference between a short and a long tone? See, the short tone says one, the long tone means zero. Now before we have a chance to confuse you on it, I want you to go one, two, three, four, zero. What have you just done? You've turned off the alarm. That's what you want to learn how to do, right? When you want to use your home. Okay, now I want you to go one, two, three, four, seven. Now, let's forget about what seven means, but let's just show you the difference. Touch the status key. Did you notice you get one long tone and then two short tones? See, after you get past level five, it gives you a long tone to represent the first five digits, and then the short beeps you add to the five. So hit the status again. Five, six, seven. You see how to read it? And that's as simple as it has to be. Now, for the sake of all of you who have a hardwire mentality, let me tell you what you keep telling our people around the country that you have to have a display on a keypad in order to make it a user-friendly keypad. Well, we've built a new keypad, a hardwired keypad that will have a display in it that will be available sometime later in the spring. But until that product has been proven out and tested and we're in production with it, uh, we did it just to satisfy those people who just won't give up the idea they need a display. And yet, coming from the hardwire industry, I want to tell you, you don't need a display out uh, anywhere except at the control panel, which the customer can take their keypad and walk to. Yes, Tony? The reason that I think that 
they wanted is mm -hmm. because many of our customers are elderly, mm -hmm. and the elderly cannot hear these tones. Okay. So these are the tones they lose first, and this is what our... Okay. So you see this remote siren right here? Well, one of the other things, since we're going to get off and answer your question, this isn't part of a presentation, and we're here to educate rather than just go through features and benefits per se. You should put a hardwire interior siren into a home because that's the only one we can have confidence is going to have sound regardless of the situation. Line carrier sirens, the wireless kind, might not work in certain conditions, but we like to use those as backup. So if you put a hardwire siren in for that elderly person that has a, maybe a little bit of a hearing problem, then you have the flexibility of moving this one and putting it beside their bed or in the different parts of the home, and they can move it around just like they can their keypad, their keypad because this truly has the potential of being a wireless system with the exception of that remote hardwire siren, which also the hardwire siren is included in the new hardwire display keypad that will be coming out too. So uh, at any rate, that would be the way I would handle the elderly person that has a hearing problem is I would put the remote wireless in the bedroom with them or tell them to move it around the home as they see fit, okay? But what I want to caution you on is that people don't know that they need a display unless you tell them they need a display. There are an awful lot of people out there that get confused by a red blinking light. What does that mean? There's a lot of people that get confused by a yellow light and a green light. And the hardwire guys are going to say, yeah, this green means go and red means stop. And it doesn't mean that with every other panel in the marketplace. So if they see four presentations, they can get confused on it. So we literally can eliminate confusion by not having a display on the keypad. And we have so many other benefits to our keypad to make up for it. Tony, let's say that whether you're a young person or an older person that has a, our system in your home and you're using our wireless keypad, one of the nice benefits of this is that with a hardwire keypad, you've got to put one by the entry doors. And if you have two entry doors, you should have a keypad by both of them, shouldn't you? So there's two keypads that you have to spend money on. And a lot of people like to have a keypad in the bedroom with them at night. Would you agree with that? Now we have to sell them three keypads. And they've got to pay a lot of unnecessary money because with an ITI system, they can have one system mounted on the wall. And if they have two entry doors, obviously they should probably put in two keypads. But they'll be more comfortable about taking one off the wall and putting it on the nightstand at night without that additional cost. What about the people today who have swimming pools in their backyard? You can take this out and put it on the table right beside the swimming pool. And now you have the 24-hour functions with putting the, the two key, depressing both symbols of that particular action on the front of the keypad. So if you want police, you just hit the two police symbols and hold them for a second. And now we have an alarm going off instead of having to run in the house and find a keypad to turn on. Yes, Joan. Okay, well, again, that's the potential of having a portable keypad like this. Maybe if, if you don't treat your security with the proper respect, somebody could misplace it. Well, here again, that's the value of having more than one where you keep one that you keep on an entry uh, exit door and have the other one that's going to be portable that you carry around. But if I can move it back, Joan, and you're perfectly right in bringing up these negatives to it, but what about a single lady who lives alone in her home or condominium or town home, and she drives up in the front driveway and she has any reason to be concerned for her safety to get inside to create her alarm. Wouldn't it be nice if she could turn her system on or off or create a panic alarm without unlocking the door and ro or rolling the window down? Would you like that feature? Well, we just happen to be pretty close to offering it to you we now have the new handheld remote keypad. It's in production, and we'll look forward to ship, start shipping them by the end of February. Should I, am I safe in saying that, Bob? Okay. How do you like that? Okay, but the thing is, because it is the bulkier, now you have cosmetically an option for your customer, and this even makes it more natural that they have one of these on the wall and another one that you carry around with you. And maybe if it's husband and wife, you end up selling them both one, one he can carry in his pocket and one she can have in her purse. 
and you literally have the ability to do something unique that the hardwire guys can't do. I want to see them use, run that umbilical cord down the driveway as they drive away. You like that? Let's pass it around and if you will, roll and see that it gets back and let everybody take a look at it. This is a working keypad. Uh, I think it's push status and see if it's on the right house code. Yeah, okay, so we know it's, it's on the right house code, so please don't be pushing the numbers while we're demonstrating and hand it back to me once everybody gets a chance to look at it. But I thought you might be uh, pleased to see that, uh, that uh, Bob Brunius and the engineering department are listening to you because you've been asking for another version of a keypad for a long time and uh, we're now getting very close to making it available to you. Okay, let me get on my notes here, if I can look at your notes, Tony, and get back to talking about ketones and, and arming levels and all. Please note that in talking with Tony as my prospect, I talked about turning it on, turning it off, and uh, maybe during the pre-sale visitation, I did get to the point of recognizing a value for this couple of giving them uh, perimeter arming which I could elect whether I want it to be level three or level six, depending on how I plan to design their system. Some of you are brand new to this. So let's see a show of hands if you don't know the difference between level three and level six. Stick your hand up in the air if you do not know the difference, okay? For the sake of the fact that people raise their hand, let me explain that if you go one, two, three, four, which is your code, and touch the three, you can go ahead and do that. One, two, three, we're in level three, Instead of turning on your complete system, what does it say, Tony? Exterior. It says exterior. It means we're only turning on the devices on the perimeter of your home. And therefore, whatever doors and windows, whatever you've put on the codes that represent the exterior part of the system will be turned on, and your delay on your delay zones will still be delayed. So you're only building a stockade around the customer who wants to be able to move around in their home without causing false alarms. But on the other hand, maybe Maybe it's a married lady whose husband is gone on a trip and she wants protection around her, but she's also worried about uh, some other part of the house that she doesn't use at night, so she'd also like some of her interior space protection on as well. So instead of going one, two, three, four, three, I want you to go one, two, three, four, six. Okay, five, six, because we've got the long tone for five, right? And you try to feel whether the customer is following you and getting comfortable with these things as you go through them and all. But if you chose level six to demonstrate instead of level three, you're simply explaining to Tony that not only does she turn on the perimeter of her home, but she has certain interior zones that are allowed to be turned on at the same time, like maybe a motion detector in the den or the other end of the house, away from the sleeping and bathroom area that people want to use at night. And now if somebody did get through that part of the house, even the interior protection can help forewarn you of an impending crisis. So try to limit yourself in the number of levels that you talk to them about on a first presentation. Talk to them about the wireless advantages of, of the keypad, of the additional siren they want to put in besides the hardwire version that they can move around the home so that if hubby has a workbench and he wants to be in the garage on Saturday morning and the rest of the family's gone, he now has the ability to have his, his security system and his tones right out there in the garage with him where he might not hear a siren that you have wired in at the other end of the house. Okay, uh, the other things that I'd like for you to understand about your system, Tony, is that you have some symbols over there on the right side that show you some 24-hour uh, emergency features that we offer you. So, first of all, I'd like for you to know the difference in the tones of your alarm. So. Uh, First of all, I'd like you to put your two fingers on the auxiliary symbols and hold them down until the alarm goes off. Okay, that's a low level tone that you would use if you're using the auxiliary feature to summon some kind of assistance. Now from there, if you will, go and do the police symbols. Hold them a little longer. Oh. Okay, let's cancel it out first. I guess I should have gone to level nine first to make sure we do it right. Okay, now then do the police. I don't think you're pressing both. There you go, now then. Got to get both fingers exactly over the symbols and hold them for one second. Notice the level of the tone is a little higher. This is a more of emergency condition because it's a police summons that we're doing. 
Okay, now I'll go ahead and cancel that one. Okay, now do fire. And that's a little higher, but it's a c consistent or constant tone rather than the uh, pulsing tone. Okay, so, and the one thing that we would work with you on uh, in demonstrating is you tend to want to go back to doing it like a calculator again. You see yourself running over the numbers? And I'd say, no, let's go one, two, three, four, and depress the keys and teach people to do it right. It's, it's better to be safe than to have egg on your face later on because the customer is going to imitate what you do if you don't be very specific in the application of the equipment. Okay. Now then, I'd like to show you some of the other features of the equipment, Tony. Let's say that uh, you want to have a, a maintenance man in the afternoon, and you have a small community where you leave the doors open half the time, so uh, either that or you want to have a babysitter in at night. So you, want to, you don't want to give away the family code, which is one, two, three, four, right? So we want to put in a second code so we can let the babysitter or the maintenance man come in and give him instructions on what to do. So I want you to go one, two, three, four, status key. Status. Now go five, six, seven, eight. Okay. And you watch the display on the front of the panel over here. And the bouncing balls confirm that it took your new code. And so what you do for this temporary code is give that new four-digit code and show them how that's the handshake. And then they go to one of these other commands that, that I've just demonstrated for you to help use the system for the period of time they have to be in the home. You see how that works? Okay. One of the other things that we have as a benefit is what if somebody comes up to you and forces you into your home as you come home some night, Tony, and you want to be able to turn off the system because you don't want to have your life threatened by these people, but you'd like the ability to still get help in what we call a covert means. So your code is what? No, your code is, that was the temporary code. Your code is one, two, three, four, and zero to turn it off, right? Okay, I want you instead, uh, let's put it in level four. Do you remember how to do that? Okay, now then, we need to go through an exit delay to give it time, and I've got about 12 seconds. Well, I have in my, this is in my demo. Do you know what I have in this one? 12 seconds, okay. So if we have 12 seconds in it, we want to give it time to go through the delay if you're demoing. And then when we come in, I want you to pretend that you're in a situation that you would have to have a duress code to help you. And I, as we come in, instead of one, two, three, four, I want you to go one, two, eight, nine, and then the zero to turn it off. Do you understand? Wait a minute. Okay, now then, go one, two. One, two, eight, nine, zero. And it turned it off just like your regular code did. But what I did, Tony, is gave you an emergency code or a duress code so that now a special signal comes into the central office that tells us that Tony is under duress. Somebody's forcing her specifically to turn off her keypad and she used a special code. So the number gives us special information to help the police respond in the proper way to her system. You like that feature? Okay. It's whatever you want to program it to be. You could make the first three digits, for those of you familiar with our equipment, your first three digits could still be the same as her, as the regular first three digits and only make the fourth digit different because a lot of other technologies only change the final digit. So if it was one, two, three, four, you might go one, two, three, nine or one, two, three, five or something like that. You have the capability of doing that if you want to. Okay, I'd like to talk about another benefit of your system because you're dealing with a supervised system in the old first generation wireless. If a transmitter didn't work, you didn't know it when you went to arm it up. It would go ahead and arm up and you just were unaware that part of your system wasn't working. Now then, if we take a situation, Tony, and we have a window that's open, and if you go over and go one, two, three, four, four to go away, Instead of four beeps, you're getting a protest. Some people say it says, no, 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 no. You know, try to find word associations to help people understand and remember these tones. And all this means is it's not accepting your code. So go ahead and put your code in and turn it off.
and see, now you've turned it off, and now we go over and we correct the problem, and now go ahead and put your code in. Four. And see, it took the four, gave you the four tones this time. Now, the other thing that some of you who use the equipment on a regular basis say, well, Wilson didn't do that right. Yes, you could have gone over and closed that window, and then the protest would have gone away to confirm for you that you did find the protest. Uh, you can do that if you like. Uh, but all I was trying to do here was help her understand the difference between finding a protest, turning it off, go solve the problem, and then come back and fix it again. Now, let's go a little different angle on it, Tony, and this time I would like to be able to have fresh air in my bedroom because I'm not concerned it's on the second floor and I'm not concerned about safety. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn, well, you've already got the system on level four, but this window is transmitter 40 according to my instruction sheet that I keep inside my keypad or wherever me, the customer, wants to keep it. And I want to turn off transmitter 40 so I can open the window tonight for fresh air. So I want you to see the key that says bypass? I want you to go one, two, three, four, bypass, and then four O. Four O. Okay. And now it gives you your, your arming level and confirms that you have shunted transmitter 40. And now you can open that window and have the fresh air tonight. And by the way, you, I've got this equipment all spread out over the room. And it may not be easy for those of you who are new to the system to see some of these features back there. But in a real presentation mode, and Joe Coleman would be the guy that should be up here doing this, then you have the ability to point out that it's displaying the bypass and all these other things in the keypad. What I'm trying to, to do here is impress upon you the more important value of helping Tony learn her functions and not confuse her with what all the displays say during a selling situation. Even though we're going to educate them to be able to go to their control panel and learn to understand all of the keypad or the the CPU functions that are displayed there. It's more important, and Tony, this is new to you, is that correct? Fairly new to you? Okay. So I hope that you're beginning to gain some confidence in learning how to do some of the things with this, because that's the one thing you have to contend with is people are afraid of their alarm system when they first put it in. And you want to get them beyond that fear of, of what they're going to do. So one of the things you're going to do by the time we get through with all the features and benefits that I'm going to suggest to you is consider putting the system in as a local system or have an arrangement with your monitoring service that for the first two weeks all alarms will be verified before you run on them to give them time to get used to their system. Don't treat it as a full-fledged alarm system until they've gotten used to it for at least two weeks. You can do a lot for your PR image in a community if you'll learn to work with your people and if they know you're not going to instantly roll on everything that happens for the first two weeks, they're going to be a little bit more comfortable and more relaxed about learning to use it properly so that they'll use it uh, when they do have an emergency later on. Any questions or comments so far? Okay, what features, Joe, do you like to sell on a, on a presentation? Like that. Oh, yes, I am. I, I sell them all. You, you show them all the levels of arming. Okay, do you teach your new people to do that? Yep. And you don't find that people get confused with it? No. But you're absolutely correct that at some time or another, you should sell the benefit of the ease of installation, that you're not going to come in and mess up the home and uh, take about two or three days to put in a system because this system, because of its sophistication in radio equipment, you're going to spend your money on technology rather than on labor. And we're going to be able to put this system in probably in maybe five or six hours or whatever numbers you're comfortable with within your company for installation of the typical system or what you're going to, you're making the evaluation of what kind of equipment you're going to put into this installation when you start projecting hours. Okay. Uh, we can talk about philosophy, and we won't remember everything. We didn't get the, the wireless advantage, which is a very valuable advantage, as Jim's pointed out to us uh, in up front. But again, the purpose of this type of seminar is to try to get you to interact and tell me from your experiences what you like, which features and benefits you use the most. And for some of the people who are fairly new to our technology, 
let them hear from you uh, your feelings about how to present this product in the home. The only thing that, uh, that maybe from years of training people, Joe, that, that I would challenge you on is I'm, I'm not comfortable yet with teaching a brand new person to try to explain all seven levels up front, and yet I can... Im okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to give everybody the opportunity to, to try to follow the KISS formula. And then uh, I have a good friend down in Houston, Texas, who doesn't use this equipment. He's basically a hardwire man to this point. We're going to convert him one of these days. But uh, this is a gentleman who has a product that has many different arming levels and features to it. And he typically shows only the simplest forms on a, to a new customer unless he needs it to close the sale how to turn it on, how to use perimeter arming, and those kind of things. And now when he goes back and he does his frequent visit, the visit with Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, he starts educating them on some of the other features that he didn't talk about earlier that exist in their system. And he continues to increase his value to his customer by adding other features to their equipment that he didn't talk to them about early, admittedly to them, because he wanted them to get familiar with the basic things they need to be comfortable with in the system, and now they, they adore him that much more because they're now adding air conditioning to their automobile without paying any more for it. And so he has a good philosophy, too, about how to sell a multifaceted or functional type of security system. And that application could apply to this. Okay, I want to take from features and benefits and kind of structure for the sake of the newer folks in the seminar and help them see how far up through the structure we've gotten. We've had the warm-up where we got acquainted with everybody. They got to like me. I got to like them. Uh, I got to, to probe and find out that they had a need that I could sell and give me my features and benefits around. I got a chance to do my price conditioning. I got to find out why they didn't buy my competitor's product if they looked at something else. I tried to get all this ammunition in my, in my belt, so to speak. And then I went through, and whether we put the survey next and create uh, a little bit more uh, warmth and, and empathy with the situation by knowing what their environment is and letting them see how our technology would apply to their lifestyle, we then go into a, uh, well, instead of product, we'll talk about features and benefits, fab, as it's known in selling circles. And what are we going to do next? Who wants to tell me? What'd you say? Close. Okay, if we have told the people enough that they like us, they like our company, they like our service, uh, we have to make a, an evaluation of their ability to afford this at some point uh, in the presentation, or we're going to make an assumption that because of the the quality of their lifestyle that uh, they can't afford it, then we've got to be down to the point where we're going to see what it takes to put it in the home. Okay, so we're now to the proposal form that you filled out, and you have, at this point, determined that the people either want a basic system or they want a full-blown system, and that's what the proposal is going to illustrate. So, asking for an order doesn't really mean asking for an order, does it, Joe? It means giving them the information and handing them the contract and a pen and letting them make the decision by either signing or, or bringing up the next thing they have to know before they can make that decision. Okay, so some of the people or somebody at lunch, I think at my table or as I wandered around after lunch, uh, brought up the, that, uh, the one thing that they've dealt with a lot in their years in this business is that uh, people want to think about it and they don't always get that first call close. And I promised you that we were going to give you something that would make it easy for you to close the first time. Now, the person who developed this and uses it is of the caliber of a Joe Coleman. He's very confident. He believes in his service and his, and, uh, his company and the support that he'll give to the system. And he's a very good closer. He's been in the executive search business before he got into this business. and. Uh, still owns, uh, as a silent partner, a portion of, of a company in Houston, Texas. But he got to the point where he'd asked for the normal uh, decisions 
to make a to make a buying decision and the people would say well gee I really like the program and I really want it but I just have to sleep on it I want to think about it a little bit and he's given them the proposal as Joe has with the price and all and they have no objection to the price and so he comes back with uh, what page is, is is that page nine he comes back and he says well as a last resort I want to help you mr. prospect and help myself at the same time we're going to give you what we call the goodwill guarantee you know the government says that anybody coming into your home to sell has an obligation to give you three days to change your mind on a purchase in the home well we don't think it's necessary to structure it so that you're limited to three days we simply tell you that if you want to go ahead and make the decision tonight here is our special offer for you to make the decision on our first visit so that there is no curse involved in making the decision tonight because you can always call me tomorrow and we'll give you your deposit back and we'll part friends now I'm talking about a guy who is a seasoned closer and a veteran at selling both in this industry and otherwise and he's only lost two deals in the last two years that I'm aware of from using the goodwill guarantee He tells me the story the last time I saw him, which was several months ago. He says, Warren, I used that close as a last alternative before walking out of there with no order at all with a young attorney whose name isn't even, even on the door of a prestigious firm here in Houston. And several days later, before I had my crew out there, he called me and said, gee, I'm sorry, but something's come up in the family. I'm embarrassed, but I need my money, and I can't go ahead with that. And my friend said, wait a minute, you don't have to apologize to me. We gave you our goodwill guarantee. Your friendship means more to us than trying to enforce a contract, even though, in this case, the three-day cooling off period was over. I'll be out there this evening when you get home with a check for your deposit because I want your business later on, unless something's come up that you think maybe we're not a good company. He's probing to see if there could be a hidden motive to wanting the money. Oh, no, it's nothing like that at all. It's, something's come up in the family. And so that evening he goes out and he hands him the fellow a check. He says, don't be embarrassed. I really enjoyed getting to know you and Nancy, and I want your business later on. He says, Warren, about two or three months after I did that, the senior law partner of the firm's 16-year-old daughter came home at 3 o'clock one afternoon, and there were two thugs in the house. And they grabbed her, and they tied her to a chair, and they stuck a gun in her mouth and said, you're going to die. He said, can you picture what a 16-year-old went through that afternoon? He said, they didn't bother her. They didn't molest her. They left her tight, and they ransacked the house and took what they wanted, and they left. And the mother showed up from shopping at 5 o'clock and found her daughter tied to the chair in the dining room. Do you know what went through that mother's mind? What she went through that afternoon? At 5.30, Dad showed up, and guess what the first thing he did after he collected his thoughts? He called a junior member of his firm and said, what was the name of that guy that you almost bought an alarm system from? And in the next week, he put in four systems for the four senior members of that firm because he was generous enough to be gracious with a fellow that had to postpone his buying decision. He says, Warren, when I was in the executive search business, I had many of people who signed contracts, and I held them to it, and they hated my guts, and I collected every penny of it. But I couldn't live with myself. I didn't like what I was doing. And since I've learned to use this type of an alternate close when everything else is done to go ahead and get a buying decision tonight, it's done wonders for my first time closing business. Now, for some of you who have, have every right to believe you've done everything in your power and the people really want to buy from you, but they want a day or two to think about it, I don't think you're going to lose anything by trying the goodwill guarantee. You're going to walk out of there with nothing tonight anyway. And you don't know what some competitor is going to come in and talk them into because you didn't have any other power to close them tonight. And he says, Warren, you won't believe this uh, the day that he told me this story, but the young fellow that I gave the check back to just called me this morning and said, now I can afford my system. And he ended up with the fifth system. It just happened the day that I heard the story for the first time about eight, ten months ago. I thought it was a very beautiful story, and I thought it's something for you to think about I want to caution you, for those of you who are new, that if you go in up front with a goodwill guarantee on the very front of your clothes, it makes you a very weak closer. And that's not what you're there. You're there to get an order. 
but it's kind of the old last resort thing when you've, when you've done everything within reason. And I don't mean go through seven closes, but you've asked within reason to make a buying decision, and they say no, and you take the time to find out why, what the no means, and they say, well, it's nothing against you, Warren. I like everything about you and your product. I just have to have a day or two to sleep on this. And most of us have been through that. I've been through that. Well, then I can take the curse off it. Say, okay, Warren, here it is. Here's my goodwill guarantee. And go ahead and get the order tonight. Let me get the paperwork done and get the order set up because we've got so many systems going in, I need to schedule your installation anyway. And between now and then, if you want to change your mind, Jack, your friendship means more to me and I'm putting it in writing than uh, trying to hold you to this agreement. Is that a deal? And people will go ahead and forget I want to think about it on that basis. You know, each of you will have to evaluate it for yourself and see if it has a place in your organization. But I think if you learn to use it in a quality manner, it can be a, a nice way to go ahead and get that decision from them and take them off the market rather than have them buying from a competitor who, see, they don't want to look at anything else now because they've made a buying decision. <coughs> And what really ends up happening, and a Joe Coleman knows this as well as I do, that you've relieved the pressure from the sale and they go ahead and sign the documents because they have this written document to back them up now, and it makes them have that sigh of relief. Gee, that wasn't so hard. It's over with. And they don't have to think about making a buying decision any longer. Okay. We're going to keep this very simple and to the point, but this is something I've used all my life in selling. And that's how to deal with the dreaded objection. And the typical objections, can you see it in the back of the room? It's hard to remember all those features. See, I'm going to take advantage of Joe here on wanting to show all of those Army levels. And I don't challenge him. He has learned to be a very sophisticated sales pre presenter of our product and in making it work. And I want to follow up and make sure that his people are as comfortable with giving all the features as he is with it. But at the same time, I'll teach the rest of you to, get, to challenge you a little bit, maybe not to show all the features the first time around uh, beyond those that need to be shown. I'm afraid of false alarming my system, but, and meaning I really don't understand how to use it properly. And that comes up with some people that they're trying to tell you they're a little confused on how to make the system work properly, or they've read all the articles in the paper about the false alarm rates of alarm systems in the area and now you're going to show them that it doesn't happen and how you can prevent it from happening with your ITI system. I can't afford it. That's a simple matter of during the course of the presentation, you have to determine their ability to buy. And if you do the price conditioning as I talked about it, you're giving them a chance to say, no, I couldn't afford twelve to $3,000, or I can by acknowledging that they would be comfortable somewhere in that price range. And last but not least, there's no reason for anybody to say, I want to think about it. And if Joe Coleman can sit there and tell me he has an 80% closing ratio, it's obvious that the goodwill guarantee has helped him once in a while with that closing ratio. Okay, good. Now, the dreaded objection can be solved if you can, again, create a mental picture for yourself. I told you about the scales earlier where you have the product on one side and the customer's or the prospect's dollars on the other side, whichever weighs the most is the one they're going to have when you walk out of there. Well, I'd like for you to create another mental picture yourself of a sales structure, a presentation of everything you're doing here is a room full of doors. And all you have to do is go around during your presentation and close and lock each door. And if you close and lock all the doors, when you get done, there is no other conclusion for the customer except to buy your product. They have nowhere to escape to. They like you. They like their product. They don't have to think about it anymore because they've, you've got an agreement with them on that. They can afford it. Everything is there, and people will literally take the product away from you. There's a lot of other things that you can hear about how to an answer objections. The feel, felt, found techniques and things like this. Many of those type of, of how to answer objections things are covered in Tom Hopkins' book, The Master of, uh, How to Master the Secrets of Selling. Uh, if you want to get into learning how to use all those techniques, that's the book to do it in. Uh, it's not something we have time to role play and, and teach you here in this seminar. Now I want to talk to you very briefly 
about the professional salesperson's follow-up. You're going to schedule an installation for sometime in the immediate future, and I'm going to suggest that you, the salesperson, have a responsibility to do one of two things, if not both. The first possibility would be that you're going to be out there to personally walk the technician through and discuss what you have generally designed that you haven't locked him into a corner with where he has some flexibility and how to make the equipment do what you've told these new customers that you're going to do. On the other hand, maybe you've done all that in a write, written form on your proposal where instead you want to be there after the technician has completed the installation at a scheduled time with Mr. and Mrs. Client and sit down with them and review the features of the system and walk them through and show them how their new system works. There is nobody in your company who has a bigger responsibility to be there at least at one of those two key times than you do, Mr. or Mrs. Salesperson. It's your customer. So your first thing that you're going to do to your new customer to prove to them that you're going to still be around after you've earned your commission is, is do one of those two things. Either uh, help the crew set it up or maybe do the walkthrough after the installation is completed and they've assured you they've tested everything out and it's working properly. Okay, a while ago you heard me suggest that maybe you want to use the system on a trial basis for the first two weeks that it's installed to create a comfort level with them where they aren't quite so concerned that the red trucks and the black and white trucks or cars are going to show up in the driveway if something goes wrong in the way they handle their system. It does give them a certain uh, amount of uh, confidence to know that you're going to do the, the initial checking on things while they get used to the system. So at the end of 15 days, you're ready to do the official hookup to the central station, whether it's nothing more than the central station now recognize they're going to respond to this as they do any other alarm. But whatever mode you're going to go through with this, you do now want to take the time to go back and physically see those people and see how much their comfort level has increased over when you install the system. Now, wait a minute, Warren. You just told me I have to make two presentations every evening. Where do I find time to go out and walk my customers through after 15 days and see that their comfort level is high? Well, you have to structure it around those times when you don't have an appointment that you can follow up on. Uh, maybe you have an appointment fall through and you can call and say, Hi, Joe, could I drop by this evening and just see how you're getting along with your system? There's a lot of ways that you do this. I have a good friend in Florida from my days in the hardwire business down in Florida who came to this business from uh, selling appliances. And he sold Sonitrol equipment. And uh, with his selling techniques, I told you, I think I told some of you or all of you earlier about his ability to put people off guard by melting the barrier. I guess I said this story at lunch, so it, not all of you heard it. But he put people off guard or disarmed them about their concern about him being a salesperson in their home by assuring them that he wasn't going to ask them to buy a thing on this visit. He was simply there to show them the services that he had to offer. And if he suggested that they had to buy anything tonight, please throw him out of the house. And this disarmed them and made them feel comfortable with him because now he'd committed himself that he couldn't ask for an order. And they relaxed and they absorbed the information much more uh, graciously and not worrying about whether he's going to twist their arm at the end and all. And he still closed the majority of his systems on the first call. Well, uh, in terms of follow-up, this man did all of his own walkthroughs, and he still sold, uh, I think, what was a record for that company of something like 21 or 22 sales with 21 or 22 installations consecutively in days of a month. And no one else had ever sold in, at that point in their keeping records for national contests. 21 or 22 systems in 21 or 22 consecutive days. Well, and to do that, he, had, he was telling me how he had to do all this other follow-up work too. So I know if you're organized enough, you have the capability of these things. You have a 30-day follow-up. Let me go back to my friend who has the ATE security group uh, close down in Houston. He not only does his follow-ups, as I'm describing them here, but he also sends the lady of the house a dozen roses with a thank you card after the installation is complete and he's done his first walkthrough with them. 
Now, we can get roses for 10 to $15 a dozen in Texas. I don't know if you can afford to do that in the part of the country you're in. So you may have to use some other kind of a little flower uh, bouquet that you could send out as a thank you to your customer. But it gives it that personal touch and reminds them that he really is grateful for their business and that he has another customer that uh, has confidence in him. And you can do the same thing in your place, in your market area. He carries it even further than that. He watches to find out when his new customers, the young couples, have a new baby, and when they do, a new sterling silver teaspoon for the child with its name engraved on it arrives at their home. His customers adore him so much, and he's a small company compared to the big companies in Houston, Texas, that I would challenge any company in the country to go to Houston, Texas and try to take his customers away from them. It can't be done. His customers adore him because he has follow through. He is a professional. The 30-day follow-up is not something you have to do in person. It's nothing more than picking the phone up while you're making some calls on Friday evening or Saturday morning and say, hi, Joan, how you doing? It's Warren. I just wanted to see how you're getting along with your system and let Joan tell you whether she's really happy with it or she's had trouble with that doggone sensor in there in the guest bedroom or whatever she wants to say so you know whether you need to follow through and make her happy with it. And every time you get in contact with these people, you're reminding them that you're still here taking care of them, looking <coughs> after them. By the way, Joan, have you run into anybody else who might have an interest in knowing about the kind of service that you've put into your home? And your customer knows that you have the right to ask them to continually keep a lookout for you to create referrals for you to call on. And so after six months, you need to continue your follow-up. And again, it can be uh, very easy. This isn't a deliberate call. It's a matter of you have a tickler file and you know that you put the Wilson system in about five, six months ago and you're in the neighborhood and you have nowhere else you have to be in the next 30 minutes. Drop by and say, hi, how are you doing, folks? I'm just in the neighborhood. If I'm not interrupting, I just want to see how you're getting along with your equipment. And they appreciate you for that. You're, being, you're making yourself uh, available to them. And now I want to go down to the anniversary of their installation. And we have a, a customer who suggested to us they'd like for us to create some kind of a tool to help them in a twofold way. One is that they would like to, to offer a service on the anniversary of the installation where the customer would be reminded they ought to have their batteries all replaced. And we just want to do an annual maintenance check to make sure that every component is working the way we said it should and it's supposed to. And so we came up with an idea and he wrote a letter to his customers on the anniversary of their installation. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Coleman, we want to thank you for allowing us to service your security needs for the last year. Congratulate you on the fact you've now had our system in for a year. And because it's been in a year, we would like to remind you of the need for annual maintenance on your security system. And we provide that service where we replace all your batteries and check out each different component for $59.95. Please note that I've attached to this letter a little document that says, who do you know on it, with places for four names, addresses, and phone numbers on it. If you'll place the names of four people in here who will just agree to let someone from our company come by and explain your service to them, for each one of them that literally lets us come by and show them the service, we'll reduce the $59.95 by $15. So if four people agree to look, your annual maintenance check doesn't cost you a thing. And the fellow that suggested that we start this called us back after he'd, we'd get sent these out on a trial run to him and test them. He says, we closed over 50% of all the names that came in on the Who Do You Know brochure. It was fantastic, and it's a natural part of his business today. Now, Joe... Somebody takes you up on this. They want you to come out and do the annual maintenance check. Who do you send out? I'll go well, if you're the one that sold it, you'll go out yourself, right. But let's say that it's somebody who bought from somebody that's no longer with your company. Now, who are you going to send out? I'll send out Wrong. We're going to send out a salesperson to do this annual maintenance check. Service too. Pardon me? Okay, well then you Okay, well then now you're training your people to do some sales functions and that's great. And you have that capability. We're going to get into that more in the management section tomorrow as far as the the merit 
of whether you're in the technical business of installing systems or whether you're in the business of selling more systems. And we'll talk about it then. But the point that I want to make for small companies that are just getting started with us, there is nothing in, in doing an annual maintenance check that a salesperson can't do. It's an ideal way to create another daytime call for yourself. And when we get into prospecting in a couple of minutes, uh, we suggest that you adopt all of those customers whose salesmen aren't any longer in your organization. And if a company's been around for a very long time, you're occasionally going to have people who the sales rep isn't any, any longer involved. So why not you, the new salesperson, adopt that customer and go out and check on them periodically? Remember, they're paying us this annual or this monthly maintenance or monitoring fee. And they need to have somebody remind them on a regular basis that, that you're doing something to earn their desire to continue to pay the monitor fee beyond the fact that it's helping supervise their home. So this is a kind of tool you can do that with, and it was created for the anniversary follow-up. The professional salesperson, as I said, should remember to send at least a thank you note, handles problems fast. We talked earlier about don't procrastinate. If the customer's got a complaint, let's nip it in the bud before it becomes a monumental thing. Let's go out and let them know that we handle the things that they're uncomfortable with as fast as we do the good things, like handing us a check for an add-on order or another system. And part of handling problems fast is calling people back immediately. Salespeople in any industry you get into have a notorious reputation for promising things that they don't deliver. I hope that none of the people who represent the ITI product line would stoop to making promises that they can't fulfill because if you do you're not a professional and obviously if you go through the the follow-up program that I've just described to you then you are keeping touch on a regular basis to let your customers know that you're there and that they are important to you even though they now are already established with you any questions or comments on the follow-up of a professional yes Joan when you ask for those four referrals, mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, no, no. You're, they're going to give you the names, and you're going to contact the four people and, and schedule a time that you can go by and present what the Wilsons have in their home and let them see what, how it would work for their lifestyle as well. And then all you do is give them credit, which even if you've already done their annual maintenance check, you can reimburse them $15 for each one that looked or however you want to do it. That's a simple thing. Yes, Matt. Uh huh. It's available to you. Should be on the marketing list. Okay. We're now to the end of the, the section on creating a sold environment. And we'd like to move on now to a new segment, Prospecting for Gold. You know, all of us have an ego. Warren Wilson has an ego. Try to keep it in check. But I always like to challenge people who come to these seminars that I've made as many phone calls and knocked on as many doors as anybody that ever comes to one of my seminars. So I think I'm qualified and an authority on some of the things that that I want you to listen to on these subjects. And so I want to first of all explain to you that we're in a numbers game. We're gambling on the results of our efforts and so prospecting is our effort at trying to control the odds and what we're going to try to work at next is defining the difference between a suspect and a prospect. We can get a whole stack of names and unless you, and Joe Coleman and his group are going to be at a home show very soon and you can collect all kinds of names from having a drawing or something and fill things out and those are suspects unless everybody who fills out his drawing card or whatever he'd do to solicit their name address and phone number someone on his professional staff takes the time to screen all those people and rates the quality of that now it comes out of the classification of suspect into the classification of a prospect what I want to do before I get into prospecting techniques is I want to take a few minutes and share with you some ideas about cold calling.
How many of you have ever picked up the phone and called a total stranger that wasn't expecting your call and tried to talk them into listening to you or letting you come out to present any product, whether it's security or something else? Joan has. Bob. Oh, good. We got a bunch of people here. Is it a lot of fun? Everybody that likes to do it, raise your hand. Oh, Joan, you're crazy. But I bless you for it. Good for you. Let me tell you what, what I'm trying to get to. Cold calling, as I said earlier today, can be fun. But we have to find ways to make cold calling fun. When I was working with that sales group that I was work building in Washington, D.C. Uh, a few years back, and we were teaching young people to get on the phone and call, we worked from the crisscross. Now that's, everybody know what a crisscross is? Crisscross gives you the, like a phone book, only it tells you where they work and how many people in the family and what their names are, and all kinds of good information. It tells you whether they're homeowners or renters. So anyhow, it gives you the ability to start qualifying these suspects to try to narrow it down to people who you would like to talk to. And I contend that it's a very essential part of any metropolitan sales organization. Metropolitan's any area, a city of 50,000 or more that has a crisscross in it. Well, we had this young man that uh, was just getting started with us, and so we went through and we role-played the dialogue, and it's on page 12 of your manual. So I just wrote some, some general descriptive dialogues for you of what you might do to help somebody learn to talk in very simple language on the phone to a total stranger. And it's very simple. Say, hello, I'm so-and-so, I represent so-and-so, and verify that uh, you're talking to the person you want to talk to. And you've got different scripts that you can work from to, to suit your personality or your company needs. But now, we had this young man who was going to do it for the first time tonight, and we role-played the, the sales talk that he's going to use on the phone together between us. And I said, okay, now uh, let's open the crisscross. And I was still new to Washington, D.C. at the time. So why don't you show me an area, a, me uh, a residential area, that would be suited to the uh, type of demographics we're looking for, the income level and, and style homes, uh, uh, value of homes and things like that. And he came to one page that had scribbling all over it. And he reached for the page corner to turn it. And I slammed my hand down on it, and he jumped out of his chair. And I said, what's the matter with this page? He says, well, Warren, somebody's already worked this page. And I said, well, Rob, I've got to explain to you. I'm an old farm boy. And before you can harvest a crop, somebody has to plant some seeds. I want to stop for a minute and think. We don't know who made the phone calls on this page, even though their ballpoint marks are all over it. But there's a possibility they may have been very poor on the phone. But just the fact that they got people on the phone long enough to initiate a conversation about security means they may have planted some seeds that they weren't successful in harvesting. So just to satisfy my curiosity, would you do me a favor and call this page and use your telephone script? And now I excuse myself and went back to my office so I wasn't standing over him listening to this presentation. And about 45 minutes later, he comes walking into my office with a smile from here to here. He says, Warren, I got six appointments off that one page. I couldn't keep him off the pages with the ballpoint scribbles on him from then on in the crisscross because he learned the value of letting other people plant seeds and he learned to relax and use a very casual but friendly tone of voice that disarmed people enough that they were willing to talk to him and now he got to see if he could generate some appointments. Okay, so the next thing that, that I challenge you to think about if you want to do cold calling so that we can find a way to make something that most people think isn't fun to be really fun is let's think about how many phone calls it's logical to set our goal to make on a, a weekly basis. Anybody want to give me a number? I had uh, someone who, who saw a success we were having with a cold call campaign in another business come into my office one time and they were going to start conducting classes on how to cold call and I said well tell me how many you would make a week and this person said 50 a week I says well congratulations you just showed me you don't know anything about cold calling because I sat down with a group of people that I was training and I says hey folks let's stop and figure out 
that if this is only going to represent a small portion of our overall daily and weekly activities, how much time can we reasonably expect ourselves to put into cold calling? And if we identify that, then the next thing is how many cold calls should we set our goal to make on a week? And we came up with a magic number of 28. 28 cold calls a week. That doesn't sound like an awful lot, does it, Chris? Well, the form that I've put together for you here has expanded a little bit to 32 calls a week. And there's three columns. So you put the, the prospect's name in the first column, their address, and their phone number. Or maybe just their name, their phone number, and a, and a results column. However you want to use the cold call sheet. But now you have your goal sheet for this week of how many cold calls you want to make.